Hey guys, how's it going? Welcome back to another episode. I'm your nerdy beta buddy. Just wanted to give you a quick introduction. I'm about to interview writer and actor of Little Bone Lodge, Neil Lin Pao. I am very nervous, but I'm also incredibly excited. So without further ado, let's just get into it. Cool. So yeah, thank yeah, thank you for I guess taking the time out to talk to me about Little Bone Lodge. <laughs> No, as I say, it's um, it's it's so nice. It's so nice to get to talk to people about it, and so nice to see that it's you know it's 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 getting a, a, an audience in more places than than little old England where it was made. You know, um, so no, I really appreciate you taking the time to watch it and to talk about it, and and, I, and I'm glad that you uh, that you found it. You know, yeah, of course, of course, yeah. Uh, so just I just want to touch on some stuff we talk, uh, we spoke about on Facebook, uh, just sure. to, just for the viewers. Um, so sure. I guess for the audience, I just want to start off with: Can you explain why uh, the name, you know, Little Bone Lodge was changed in other countries and oh then yeah, in Australia yeah, it's last exit. <laughs> so in Australia it's last exit, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, do you know what it's? I'll probably get in trouble for saying this. Oh, um, no. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> no, not at all. But it's one of those ones where, you know, as a, as a, as a writer or, you know, like I personally couldn't give two shits what they call it. You know, it yeah, doesn't make course, any yeah. difference to me. So for me, it all starts with character and then it's about how the story organically kind of grows from there. But I know it's, it's something that was a bit of a, you know, an awakening to me as I was even developing the script because um Matthias who was always attached to direct the film had sort of said to me very early on when I was pitching him the 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 sort of the story he was like what's it called I said I don't know mate you call it whatever you like and he said well the thing is you know when we're taking it to production companies very early on in their head they're they're picturing a a thumbnail or they're picturing a movie uh poster and they're thinking well what's this film called how does it capture the imagination so we actually sort of went around the houses quite a bit on film titles and uh, he was looking for something that sort of like had a bit of a recall to to uh, something sort of with, with, with the, the, the name of the property, something with a bit of a recall to other things that might have been familiar, but also a bit different. And we went around, around a few things and Little Bone Lodge was something that we both thought was was kind of cool. And so it's always been from its very first draft or even from the, the very first treatment deck that went out to production companies was always called little bone lodge okay um so for me that's what the film's called but as we were uh, when we had sold it um to different territories there was specifically in the states for instance there was a sort of uh, a, a line of thinking that little bone lodge sounded too much like a sort of a horror film and they their their plan for the film was to market it more as a um, a, a psychological thriller, which I think ultimately is what it is. I mean, I if somebody asked me, you know, what genre the film is, I would say it's a psychological thriller um, or a mystery thriller with elements of horror, I suppose, in it. But um, but they felt that uh, that the little Bone, little Bone Lodge was a bit too on the nose, and we're looking for something different. And credit to them, they asked us to come up with some alternative title suggestions. And there's a couple. Um, I really like the idea of calling it. Um, uh, what, my brain's just gone. Uh, I like. I wanted to call it um, "No Place Like Home," which I okay. thought, you know, when you watch the film, has kind of a double meaning. Um, obviously, "No Place Like Home" being like a very comforting saying, but then obviously, when you see the film with the context of what the house is, it kind of has some meaning too. And I also like the 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 title "Last Exit to Nowhere." And again, I think that that's what the, they went with, but they shortened out the, the "To Nowhere" and just called it "The Last Exit." So, yeah, for me, it kind of it it sort of says it does what it says on the tin i mean this is essentially kind of uh you know the last exit uh, in in many respects for characters and whatnot so it kind of works but um but equally from my perspective you know it's like as long as people watch it i don't care what they call it as long as i don't say as long as i don't call it shit <laughs> <laughs> of course of course yeah <laughs> no awesome yeah thank you for that so yeah, obviously you wrote and you starred in the film when mm. writing this movie and your character jack in particular did you know mm. from the start you were going to be playing jack i think we spoke about this again on facebook but just for the audience no no of course of course yeah i mean look it's i was definitely at a point in my career where you know 
it, I had as an actor, it, things had sort of really plateaued, and I was treading water, and and the the things that I wanted to do were not necessarily the things I was being asked to do, and that was really frustrating. And I'd almost sort of taken a very much well, I'd very much taken a back step to it. I was saying no to a lot of things, and you know, and and trying to take control over the things I was doing by not getting involved in the projects I didn't think were going to fulfill me or I wasn't going to enjoy it. I'd done that a few times where I sort of found myself on set and thinking like what the fuck am I doing? Like, this is not, you know, if I can't enjoy this, then why am I doing it? Cause this is ultimately what I want to do with my life. And yeah. Um, so I took a step back and I, and I was working mainly as a, as an executive producer for a, a commercials production company. And I got to work with some amazing directors and amazing talent, but, um, but I wasn't doing the thing that I really wanted to do. And, and, uh, and, and I had this sort of rude awakening that if I didn't do it now, then it would pass me by. Um, so I made a couple of short films that had been designed as vehicles for me to play the lead in them. And I wrote them out of necessity because no one was no one was casting me in those parts. Yeah. Um, and I was really lucky that, that these few short films that I did performed really well on the sort of short film festival circuit, and they got a lot of positive um, uh, attention. And it led me to Matthias, who sort of said to me, "Look, I think you know if you if you can come up with a, a an idea that's contained and that's small." write yourself in the part that you want to play and then we'll look to get it made so you know credit to him for backing me um but that was it so it, from from my perspective it was it was written for me to play the lead well let's say one of one of the leads to play jack and the reality is i was in a position in my life where it was i had a job and like you know i've, I've got my family and my and my job and and i was comfortable in that aspect of things so there was really no need for me to make this film or to put my time into this film if it wasn't going to be doing the thing that I needed it to do which was was for me to play that part so that was uh that was my line in the sand with it you know I didn't care about uh money and I didn't care about you know uh a lot of the other stuff that sometimes can you know you can get hung up on when you're trying to make a film my, my thing was like you do what you want as long as you know I get to play the part that I've written for myself and I was fortunate that both Matthias, the director, and the producers uh, in Mark Lane, um, they 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 stuck to me. They stuck with me um, because I I I know just from a from a business perspective, it's always going to be easier to finance a film when you've got people in the film that everybody knows, you know, or at least has you know what what you consider to be commercial value, um, recognizability, and and I, and I don't bring that to the film. So, um, yeah, it was it it's easy enough to say I wrote it for me, but you've still got to get someone who then says, fine, well, we're going to, we're going to support you and make sure that money gets put into it to do that film. So yeah, that's a long winded way to answer your question. I'm sorry, but no, no, uh, that, that's great. That's awesome. That's great. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um. Yeah. So yeah, you pretty much just answered my next question was, you know, I was going to ask if there was any like pushback from Matthias or anything when you said you were going to play the character, but never, yeah, yeah. never, never from Matthias. No, never. I mean, I would imagine uh, that there were conversations between the financiers and and the, the production that were like, what do we think about finding a jack? You know, uh, yeah, I'm sure yeah. that I, I I imagine those conversations probably happened, but as I say, um, my guys they all they all you know they all backed me from the start, and that was you know that was great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that that's that's yeah that that would be really I guess make it a bit easier, wouldn't it? Well, yeah, just, I mean, it, it, without sounding like obnoxious, I just, the film just wouldn't have gotten, I just wouldn't have, have done it, you know, because I was very much in a position, as I say, where it's like, this has to, there's only reason to do this is to do it, it you know, that's the thing that, I, that, that I'm most proud of about Little Bone Rogers. Me and Matthias both went into it with an objective. Mine was, it had to give my career a shot in the arm. And for him, he'd made a, a couple of successful feature films, which were in very different genres. And one was a sort of a, a, a horror comedy film, which has got like a sort of cult classic sort of status to it. And the other one was more of a, a big sweeping extra, uh, uh, sorry, big sweeping epic with like 2000 extras on set, you know, oh, wow. like big feudal battle scenes set in like, you know, uh, feudal Japan and things with Dave Bautista and you know, a lot of fun, that film. But he wanted to make something that showed actors that he could work with actors because, you know, he'd done a broad comedy and then he had done a big sort of, you know, effects driven action film. And he was like, I want to be able to make a film that is really about the characters and the performances. And then hopefully that sort of opens up some doors to him that might not have been open. And I think retrospectively, the film's been out since May here in the UK, and it's definitely opened up doors for both of us since then that, that, were probably closed before so you know with that in mind it's, it's done exactly what it needed to do yeah um, yeah so we're, <laughs> we're really lucky 
So do you think it was a bit easier to play the part of Jack because you wrote the character? Like it was your own sort of, I guess, like your own vision that you, you had written? Yeah, no, th- I, I think so. I think when you're when you're writing something and you and you have an understanding of, uh, or when you're playing something, um, ordinarily you have to to start with trying to build a sense of who this person is. But when you've written it, you've done so much of the prep work that an actor would normally do, just in, you know, sort of building the character and understanding who they are and where they come from. So in that respect, I, I probably had a shortcut of about sort of six months of work, you know. Um, and inevitably, when I was writing it, I always had my my voice in in my head, you know, as in the person who would actualize the, the character. So it was easy for me to sort of to to see how certain beats might play. What's kind of cool is that as an actor, you know, you you really are only as uh, uh, you know you're only as good as the as how you how well you're able to listen and respond to the people that you're in the scenes with. So if I had come into any one of those scenes with these really locked in ideas that I'd had from the day that I wrote them and not been flexible or not been listening to the people who were in the scenes with me and how they were interpreting the characters, because, you know, ultimately that's it. It's all well and good writing something, but the minute you populate it with other people's talent, it becomes a collective vision that belongs to everybody. Um, And, you know, for instance, like Jolie had a take on Mama, which might not necessarily have been the voice that was in my head when I wrote it. And Harry had a voice, uh, a take on Matty and Sadie on, on Maisie, and they all made it better. But if I had planned too vigorously as to what I thought these scenes would be, I think the film would have been worse. There's definitely scenes in there that are not how they played in my head on the, on the page, but, um, but I'm happy, you know, I, I think it makes it better. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, mm. I, I guess uh, watching the film, like it, the whole cast was just amazing. Like they all did an amazing job. So yeah. Thanks man. I think that's one of the things that we're all kind of really, really proud of because it, it's such a, it is such a tiny, tiny film. Like honestly, you wouldn't believe how much money it was made for. I mean, I, like your shirt probably costs as much money. As <laughs> <laughs> no, but, but in all, in all reality, it was such a small film, and to have assembled the cast that we got was incredible. I mean, to have Jody Richardson, who you know came on to, I've said this to a couple of people in in interviews, and it sounds like a like like bullshit, but for her to come and make a film like this is a massive gamble because she's already so established as somebody who has done some amazing things and you know she's pretty much sort of british acting royalty you know she comes from that dynasty of 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 talent and she certainly doesn't need to come and do a film that's this small um with so much risk attached to it that she's sort of like you know lending her talents to us and it's filming if we fuck it up you know it, it doesn't you know it could have reflect negatively on her but she came in with like just nothing but sheer uh a collaborative power and enthusiasm and she you know she's there she was there every single day like ready to go those hits that mama takes in the film they're all her there's no body doubles there's not you know it's like she's just she's an absolute machine and you know such a great collaborator to work with and and then you know harry and sadie who played matty and um and and Maisie, they were they're both on the cusp of really big things they're both sort of got huge netflix shows that are uh, uh about to drop one in the uk here for uh harry and sadie's uh, you know in uh emerald Fennell, fennel's new film saltburn with rosamund pike and you know so they're just they're, you know they're set they're gonna go and we had you know the, the supporting actors like you know roger who played par and cliff who played uh adams and um uh cameron who played McAllister and ewan who played duncan and sharon who was Bella, um, Jamie, who was the, the, the police officer Stanton. They're all like such such a high caliber of actor to get on board for a film with no money. Um, and they just, I think that's the that's one of the things that many people have, have been complimentary about with the film is that they thought the performances were, you know, were, were the thing that kind of elevated what could have potentially been a sort of a bit of a, a schlocky B movie, you know? Yeah, um, yeah. I'm not saying it's not a B movie, but like, you know, because I think that, the, the, you know, those are sometimes the most fun ones, but... Um, but yeah, I think the performances are the thing that kind of anchors it into into a sense of kind of believability. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Sorry, I chalk up absolute bollocks on these things. Mate. No, so no, you're you, fine. No, that's great. You no, need to cut any of this stuff, please do. No, no, yeah. no, it's all great. It's all great. So I guess by the sounds of it, like everyone just wanted to be there, like working on the project. Well, I think, yeah, I think it has to be like that on one of these films because it's certainly no one's getting rich off of it, you know? Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think, I 
think with these films, like I heard this amazing phrase a few years ago. One of my uh, sort of good friend of mine is a, a, a big sort of film and TV director in the UK. He said to me, I was making a short film and I said, have you got any advice? And he said, yeah, just remember that no one gives a shit about your film as much as you do. So if you can surround yourself by as many people who do care, then you're going to have a better product because ultimately the thing that we did that we got really right on with Little Bone Lodges, almost exclusively everybody on that project was stepping up a role. So like the, the DOP is a, is like one of my best friends who, you know, was the shot my very first short film with me. He had done, he'd been a camera operator and a focus puller on some huge projects, but he had never sort of been able, he'd never been the DOP on a, on a film. And we made a, a sort of a hundred pound short film in a couple of hours. And that was a, a film that did really well in the festival circuits and then kind of led us on to do some other stuff and led him on to do uh, other films. And now he's absolutely killing it. He's done three or four films since Little Bone Lodge and he's just, in a, his career is in a great place. But he, that was the first feature that he, he had been the DOP on and he managed to bring a crew with him that had all come off of a big Netflix TV series over here that were all, had all been paid Netflix money for, four months and we're now ready to go and support him on his feature the our first ad who did a great job was usually a second or a third on other films you know our uh uh, everybody basically was stepped up uh to 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 a more senior position than they've been in and and sometimes that can mean that things you know might not be as well oiled as they might have been on a bigger production but the reality is everybody has slightly more of a vested interest in it because they're all getting that sort of elevated um step up than they, they would have had so they've all got something to be a bit hungry for mm. and it just means they all care that little bit more than they might ordinarily if it was like you know not to be disrespectful but season three of a tv show that you know block four season three of a tv show that's been running for however mm. long that it's just a payday you know it's just like this is my nine to five for whatever you know so i think that 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 really helped that was what made it possible yeah um and good producers so. Yeah, yeah, that's awesome. That's awesome. So you you mentioned Jolie Richardson. Uh, mm-hmm. what was that like working with her? Like, I guess was it in some ways a bit of a learning experience, like watching her, or what? Like, what was that like? <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I just you know, I I was um wasn't really sure you know what 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 to what what to think that Jolie might be like you know um because she had uh you know matthias had sort of said very early on that jody was was someone that he thought was was going to be you know excellent for mama and i was just like oh my god if you can get jody richardson then that would be amazing and he yeah. he you know he sort of um went after her a couple of times and i i know that that she took a bit of convincing to come and do the film you know and her, her schedule didn't align a couple of times and also probably just like i said it was a gamble and, and she took a bit of convincing so it almost sort of like you know when she came down to do the the, the cast and crew read through you could just tell right from the go that she'd made a decision and she doesn't make decisions on a whim, you know? So she was like, I'm here and I'm going to give this the best that I have. And I ha- I think I had a, a really, really great working relationship with her because she'd often asked me about things within the script. She often came to the table armed with ideas of her own that might, you know, have, you know, maybe slight line changes or this out of the other, but all stuff that was, was never, ever geared around um, ego or sort of personal kind of like, um, uh, I don't know, I, I guess no personal interest in it. It was always what's the best for the film. Um, and, and I've given this example before, but, but what was really great, it's like to personify it was there's the scene in the, in the kitchen where uh, Matty has a, as, as a kind of a, um, an outburst of anger and rage and he's sort of like thrashing his arms around and the picture gets knocked off the wall mm-hmm. and she sort of comforts him and harry harry is incredible but this is also the first feature film that he's done he's done you know as i say he had done some tv and stuff but this was the first film that he had done and um he was doing some amazing stuff but he was kind of pulling his face into her chest and this was all sort of like a a, a close-up on her and I think Jodie was realizing that in the coverage that we were, because she's always just her experience of being on set for so long, being so many films, she just knows always where the light is and she knows always where you know the best angles are and stuff. She's just got such a great intuitive understanding of coverage. And she was sort of saying to Harry, look, what you're doing is great, but at the minute, everyone's going to miss that because the shot is here on me and your head is 
pulled into me. Now, if I open my body up around here and turn your head like that, now we're going to get all of that that, you, that you're doing into camera. And she would, so she would turn like what should be a close up of her into a two shot of them both to okay. maximize what was going on. And I think when you have somebody who's number one, got that awareness, but number two, got that absolute lack of ego, it's just only going to make the film, uh, you know, a, 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 a better thing for everybody. I mean, she she had standards that she expected to be upheld um and everybody did their best to do that and um yeah i just uh i thought she was great yeah yeah, yeah. Nothing, nothing nothing but admiration and positivity for her for sure yeah yeah 100 percent. so this film is shot really well it's quite beautiful from very early yeah. on in the film the tension and the i guess the the claustrophobic feeling is very prevalent throughout the whole story the whole way through was that something that came naturally when writing the the film or did it take a bit of setting up and like multiple drafts? No, I think, I think the thing was like, I love contained, you know, to answer that sort of twofold, I absolutely love contained films. Like, you know, I, I, I'd love to, I'd love to try uh, and be as clever as possible with, with the writing. I think that um, the best films have some sort of sense of misdirection or a rug pull that kind of, you know, will we'll, we'll surprise an audience. And I, I was, you know, very keen to do that. And you look at some of those, some of those films um, that you know, I would have grown up with, that, you know, around the, around the nineties and stuff, that's sort of the, the uh, films like The Usual Suspects and Primal Fear, um, some of David Finch's early things like The Game and Fight Club. And uh, they're all films that, that, that rely on kind of uh, tricking the audience. Then you've got films like Misery, which are all sort of like contained to one location. And I always felt that the best films were the ones where, you had to be smartest if you couldn't leave a room or you couldn't leave a property. So did that, that was, that was something that interested me from a, from a narrative point of view. And then from a, just a tech, just from a logistics point of view, like Matthias, when he, when he had seen my short films, both of them uh, are set in one, one space. So one of them set in a prison cell and one of them set in a, on a hospital ward at night. Um, and that was mainly due number one because I like those contained narratives, but also due to you know being economic in cost. When you're making a short film, if you've got no money, it's like well, let's try not to get around too much, you know. Yes. So yeah. I had um, I, they had been planned that way, and we, we were actually in lockdown when my second short film was was released, and Matthias had seen it, and he was like, "Look, I think, I think." Production companies are going to want to make films that can be contained to one location, that can be shot in minimal days for a minimal budget and both of your short films are kind of genre films with like a high concept that are set in one one place do you do you have any ideas for a feature that would do that so the sense of that was was uh, of isolation and, and and claustrophobia was in was in there from the very initial concept but but in fairness to Matthias and to Job the DOP you know to, it's easy for me to write that but they have to bring it to life you know and I think that that the credit goes to them for so the you know the 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 things that you like about it, which is the you know the cinematography and the the camera language, um, about how you you create that sense of claustrophobia, um, you know that's 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 on that's on them. Yeah, yeah, okay, very interesting. So I guess uh, sticking to the I guess the character side of things for the moment, mm. uh, I really liked the dynamic between the brothers Jack and uh, Maddie. Uh, yeah. So I guess. In one aspect, you know, I noticed it was, you know, Jack, you know, a little bit frustrated with Maddie, but then also coming from a place of love on the other hand. Mm. What was that like, I guess, you know, what was the writing process between the brothers and the inspirations? So, like, I know uh, in general you just said, like, you mentioned Misery, and I got, like, a lot of Stephen King vibes with the self-contained mm -hmm. location, but, yeah, yeah. Um, do you know, I think... It it was a couple of things really. So in terms of the brother relationship, like, so I'm one of two brothers and our relationship couldn't be further from what's portrayed in the film. You know, he's like my best friend. We're very, very close. Um, mm -hmm. But I was really interested in this idea of, of um, a forced responsibility, you know, and sort of being forced to be older and grow up uh faster than you were ready to i mean ironically i i i wasn't i was a new parent at the time of of the film you know of me writing the film and i was interested in exploring these sort of themes about not actually being fundamentally equipped to be you know to be ready to be responsible for somebody else 
and you know obviously the 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 the, the relationship between the two brothers is completely different to any sort of parental relationship that, that I would have with my kids but but there was this sort of sense of like you know uh um a frustration as well at sort of like being you know kind of being now in a situation where it's like I, I don't feel like I'm able to do this but I have to you know mm. um and I thought it would be interesting to see interesting to see like what would happen if you actually push that into something you know um uh much bigger on a on a film scale so that's where that started and i thought well, okay well what what are relationships that could be strained or, or or could be difficult and um there is there's neurodiversity that runs through my family as well and i was kind of really curious to sort of see neurodiversity represented in a film that wasn't about the character's neurodiversity so you know you take films like like rain man or or um music or any of these other films that have some sort of portrayal of autism or other other neurodiversities and the 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 story is always based around that you know um and you never just sort of see a neurodiverse character in a soap opera who just lives in the neighborhood and just gets on with their life do you know what i mean it's always yeah yeah it's always have to be about that and i just so i wanted to take a character that isn't usually represented in these sort of stories and put them in it and and i thought that that would help to create a really interesting dynamic between these two guys where they're in, they're they're intrinsically kind of tied together um and they'll never be able to separate from each other but they're actually sort of quite toxic for each other at the same time mm, um, yeah yeah because uh, jack ultimately is a character that's kind of bullied and blustered his way through life but believes that everything that he's doing is for the best of his brother but never actually asks his brother what he wants and matt is a character who is has basically developed like a emotionally unstable personality disorder as he's as he's grown up because he's been sort of like pulled and hoiked around um and has been never really been able to bond or have um some a, a, anybody recognize that he has specific needs and should be cared for in a different way um so yeah uh i guess that that, that was it. it was just trying to create two complex characters with a need that keeps them together but things that drive them apart you know yeah um, yeah yeah very very interesting very i guess uh touching on the complex characters mm. uh i noticed you know i found myself uh in the movie i was like rooting for jack and then i realized i was like oh but like no one's really innocent here <laughs> like it's like morally it was like a lot of great like it wasn't black and white and i really really liked that <laughs> Well, yeah, I think that's the point, isn't it? I mean, like, you know, nobody in real life, nobody thinks that they're the bad guy. Yeah. You know, yeah. and and the truth be told, you know, you get you get people do some horrendous things, but very, very few people are out and out evil. You know, there's that sort of daft saying that even bad men love their mums, you know, like it sounds like a stupid thing to say, but like um there is this sort of sense that that there's good and there's good capable in everybody. And I think that um that I wanted to to create a story where at any given point you're not quite sure who you should be rooting for, but they should all have some sort of likable and redeemable quality. So even even Mama, you know, by the time you get to the end of the film, there should be a sense of understanding as to why she's doing what she's doing. And whilst you know, the you role reverse ultimately where you take the antagonist and the protagonist and you kind of flip them on their heads, I still think that there is something about her that. It, it, and it's a testament to the to to Jodie's performance as, as you know as much as what we tried to construct from the the narrative is that you know if you if you like her early on you can somewhat understand or 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 forgive what she does not maybe not forgive but understand what she's doing later and still have some sort of sense that you don't want her to get her full on comeuppance you know and yeah. then the same with, with with Jack like if you make him too vanilla early on and he's just too like nicey nice then it's boring you know but if you make him too too horrible then he's completely irredeemable and you have to be able to redeem him because i think if you get to the end of the film and you don't care about his character at all then the film probably hasn't worked for you so it's about trying to balance that out so that you have this sense of light and shade in all of them uh, matty and the only one who's truly innocent in the film is is probably Maisie and par um but yeah, specifically yeah. Maisie. um and everybody else uh, has has something lurking you know yeah yeah i guess um like and you mentioned i guess you know uh you know caring for jack at the end of the film and like 
just talking about that twist oh my goodness <laughs> that that uh wow <laughs> i was shocked like that, yeah. that took me a few days to process <laughs> well, the, very, um, the, the bit at the very end yes 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 i was a little right, bit right, right. uh I didn't see it coming. I didn't see it coming. Right. How did you um, think it was going to end? I don't really know. I just, I didn't see that though. <laughs> and I felt really right. sorry, right. I guess, for the brothers. Um, What was that like filming yeah. that? And I guess. That, do you know what? Like, as, as daft as it sounds, the film wasn't a lot of fun to make, you know, yeah. because it was a lot of fun. The, cre- the, 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 the getting the film made and the sort of, uh, the creative, the creative and collaborative process of making the film was fun, um, but the actual shoot was 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 rough because we had nineteen days to shoot. We had twenty days to shoot the film, and ironically, we had a storm in the UK during the shoot, which shut production down for a day. But so it was just a windstorm, and it didn't look like there was a storm. So on that day, not only could we not shoot, but you couldn't even get sort of you know properly get any kind of B footage or anything because like it just it looked like there was a breeze in the air, and that was about it. But you know, the roads were blocked off, and there was some you know some accidents and stuff. So we shot the film in nineteen days, and there's a lot there's a lot to shoot in in that time, you know. Um, and a lot of it it was shot in February in freezing cold when we're outside, we're under rain towers. Or I'm lying like face down in mud, getting dragged around. It's fucking horrible. <laughs> or we were in that, you know, that that um, the scene in the basement was shot in an outside barn. Mm. Um, it was like minus something rather in there, and we were lying on the cold, like stone floor all day. It was really quite arduous. And that bit at the end there with the, you know, in in that room, that was probably, you know, I'd had you know a long old day of shooting, and we were like, we've got twenty minutes to get this. So then I had to sit there while they put the prosthetic on, and then kind of like, you know, I had a wig which then took that off, and some other bits and pieces, and it was just, I, I was just fucked. So that scene there, I'm just sort of sitting there with my eyes closed. It was about the most peace I got in the entire <laughs> shoot. It was the only time that I just sort of, thought, oh, I'm just going to fall asleep here. It'd be quite nice. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that bit was that bit was all right. Um, and I think, you know, from a narrative point of view, I thought it was important that, you know, most most of the characters ironically get a happy ending, you know, in to a to a degree. You know, Maisie's probably gonna be fucked up for the rest of her life, but she's she's, you know, a lot of therapy, but she's out and mm-hmm. so's part, and there's an opportunity to rebuild and and mama gets uh, gets a son and, and Matty gets a, a mum. But there's one character, you know, it's no one has to lose and to, to have some sort of narrative impact. And I I thought it was probably going to be most effective for the character that initially you'll probably hate to then warm you to him, make you like him and then fuck you over by having something really horrible happen to him would kind of be the most impactful way to end the film. It would have been too obvious to have mama be defeated and get her comeuppance or, you know, or whatever. So I kind of wanted, I wanted her to get away, but I didn't think everybody should, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And uh, mission accomplished. <laughs> <laughs> No, yeah, and so uh, just going back, uh, so you said that the film took, I think, uh, twenty days. You said to, I guess, yeah, to that's film. what we initially had, yeah, and then we lost a day. So. so was that tight? Uh, was that tight schedule stressful, or did it come together quite smoothly, or was it a bit of bit of a mixture of both? I think I think it's always stressful. Um, but what I would say here is, uh, you know, being a writer and and and, and an actor in it, like. I didn't have to deal with any of that stuff. I mean, I had the schedules in like, these are the days, this is what we're shooting on any given day. And a lot of the time, you know, we felt very pressed for coverage because uh, it's, although it's, you know, although it's all set in one house, there's a lot to shoot in, uh, you know, in that amount of time. We're shooting sort of five or six pages a day. And it's, you know, there there are some, and there's some stunt work in there. There's some set pieces, there's some fights, but um, it did feel very pressed for time. But you know, the first AD, the producers and Matthias were the ones that really sort of took the weight of that on. Um, so I never really felt stressed from that. They kept that away from me, which was great. So I never really felt stressed by those things. Oh, awesome. Oh, that's I'm all right. Sure, I'm sure they did. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, so that's all the questions I had. So Amazing. yeah, yeah. No, thank you very much for answering my questions and taking the time out of your, out of your night to come and chat to no, me about no. the film. No, and thank you for, as I say, like I said at the top, thanks for watching it. Thanks for supporting it. Uh, I'm glad you liked it. Yeah. And yeah. I hope that um, I hope that you know uh, people in Australia get the chance to see it and uh, and support it as well. And you know, just sort of remember that it is a it is a small film that you know is uh, that we we've been been really lucky. You know, there's been I've seen a bunch of sort of like 
you know, I sound like I'm a bit of an arrogant prick here, but I've seen like some top, you know, 10, top 20, like horror films or genre films of 2023. And we've been popping up on a bunch of these lists, which mm. seems incredible to me because you're seeing that, you know, you've got 60, 70, $100 million movies on that list. And then you've got our film, which, you know, wouldn't pay for catering on theirs for, for a week, you know? Um, so it, it, I do feel immensely proud that that we've done that, and I I hope that people they go into it and enjoy it. And I'd say that you're best off knowing as little about it as possible. Um, yeah, yeah, hundred percent, hundred percent. Um, yeah, that's it. Yeah, yeah. No, awesome. Thank you very much for that.